Good morning, good people. As you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, but I got my, uh, my workout spandex on. Just bought these this week because it is winter. Ah, what pussy. And uh, which is winter, which means it's cold in the mornings, but we're allowed to go outside and exercise. Praise the Lord. And once again, I picked up a straggler. And that straggler is going to be joining us this morning with a nice little social distancing setup over here. So I'm going to reveal the identity of said straggler after the title sequence. Surpassed 10,000. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, He's urging all residents, but also the hell. Stay in their homes so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Alrighty, guys, welcome to Almost Church. Today, I am going to be presenting with the one and only. Hello! Hello guys, Bluetooth hug, Bluetooth. What? Bluetooth hug. Bluetooth hug? Yeah, that's so that? social distance, remember? Okay, how did you go? Just, uh, that felt good, that felt good. <laughs> felt the love. Felt felt the love. lame to me, bro. So this is Salau, uh, he is part of my home group, is that right? Ah, oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's right. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> that is right. Also his first time on Almost Church, welcome to the Almost Church presenter panel. Okay, so, so first of all tell us, when did you get saved? I've been saved for, let me count, June, July, uh, 11 months, 11 months, yeah. Only 11 months, bro? I'm still, uh, what yeah, do you call baby. it? Honeymoon phase in the faith, honeymoon phase. Hey yeah. dude, may we all be in honeymoon phases all day long. You bro. didn't give me coffee. Um, um, yeah, it's because you're in honeymoon phase. I need the coffee to get me up in the morning, bro. <laughs> I just raised my phone there. But yeah, it's been super amazing ever since then. How did you get saved, dude? Tell the, tell the people what I went to the Sunningdale, I don't know, conference or something, Jonathan. I can't say his surname. Jonathan Conrath, the, That's the, name. the evangelist. Actually, yes, he's the guy that Andrew Selly mentioned last week on Almost Church. Oh, that's the guy. And then his speech was so powerful, you could just feel like the Holy Spirit like piercing through my heart. Like, dude, sweet dude, like, son, this is your time now. Just come to me. I've been waiting for you for quite a while. And I was so overwhelmed. Like, I think I was in tears. And then Howard came to comfort me and just, yeah. I gave you a real hug, not a Bluetooth hug. <laughs> Definitely. And yeah, the, the rest is history. And now, yeah, I'm wearing my durag next to my comm leader. That's powerful stuff, awesome, guys. Awesome. 11 months ago, you were dead to the things of God. And yeah. now you are like alive. And I mean, just so you guys know, Salah's an amazing dude. And like, he's got such a massive heart. <laughs> and he just loves to like care for people. Um, and he's actually quite a softy. Even though he looks so like <laughs> hardcore, you are a softy. I'm a big softy. Um, Too big, yeah. But yeah. So let's kick into it. So guys, first up, we're going to have a little segment called Getting Personal. And because we can't meet in massive groups at the moment, um, we still want to try and create a sense of getting to know each other. And in particular, let's get, let's get. some of the leaders in 412 and some of the faces that you might see on a big stage when we have a, a 412 conference or you might see them like leading your congregation or um, you might see them on an outreach but do you really know them so we thought you know it's an amazing opportunity to get personal to get behind uh, behind the scenes last week we showed you the, the home of prophetess milani and it was really cool just to go and like get to know her like what what makes milani milani um, and we saw her paintings, and we saw her house, and we saw her oh, dogs, chickens. and her chickens. The chickens. chickens. There you go. What do you think of the chickens? <laughs> Gotta think of the chickens. So without further ado, check it out. Maybe you've seen them from a distance, spotted them prophesying, preaching, or quietly serving behind the scenes. But do you really know them? Well, we're taking you into the lives and lounges of leaders from around the 412 field, hearing what makes them tick their highs, their lows, meeting their families, visiting their homes. Come on down and let's get personal. We are the Mabrazies! Hello! What you doing? Oh, good to see you everyone. We are currently working on a Bible equip for the book of Colossians. So I'm studying Revelation. <laughs> right, let's see what else is happening. Holly is doing a bit of light reading. It's for history. <laughs> Very cute. On three here. This is my favorite room in the house. Sky, what are you up to? I'm doing maths. Are you really? Oh, she really is, okay. And Connor, what are you up to? I am baking some cookies for people in our church. Fantastic. Connor has actually become a master baker over this lockdown. Okay, guys. 
guys. Hi, welcome. Hey guys. This is our house. We're flatties. We're missing one flatty because she is out walking. I'm Robin King and this is Jillian Beery. We are from Oxygen Life Church here in Port Elizabeth. Yo, so keen to see you all again when we can. Yeah, I'm and, excited. Uh, what's I'm really excited. Jokes? I'm having um, oats with cinnamon. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're coming up the stairs. We are going into our upper room. Very colorful and bright. <laughs> what are you doing? I was just loving the picture by the world's greatest artist, Milani Dutoy. <laughs> I want to show you the piece de resistance. <laughs> Yep, that's Connor. And this is what Connor does. <laughs> We're currently working on a track for church, but this is the music studio. I used to be a music producer and I hang out here a lot. We make worship here. We record many, many songs. We'll take you through to the other room. This is our recording room. Pianos, Holly is normally there. We sing in here, we make music here, we love this house. It's a great blessing from the Lord and we use it always to glorify him, to worship him, and to declare the good news of who he is. So welcome to Glen Helen, it's been great being with you. We are caretaking a Milani de Toy at the moment and I have a bit of a thing about collecting art from people that I know. So I'm gonna take you on a little outing. We're gonna go to the art gallery in my house series of three pieces done by a previous housemate, Sibu. She's also from Oxygen Life Church. Shout out Sibu. So, this little guy is by Nubonge. It says fastened. He is the thread that weaves and holds our hearts together. He never frays. This one here is by Rihanna, it's a beautiful coral reef. She actually does finance and paints a little bit on the side. And then this one is by Hile de Beer, also from Oxygen Life Church. This one is by Guy Hart, has done this beautiful sketch based on the Skeleton Coast. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks so much for joining me on this amazing art tour. Maybe one day we'll host you and you can see it for yourself. We miss you, we oh love you, and hopefully and we'll see you soon. Life. You guys are loved, bye. For the more perceptive of you, you may notice that the lighting has suddenly changed all around me. Uh, that's because I forgot to shoot this particular link this morning, and then I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to do the finance teaching segment. So here it is, guys. For each day and each week that the world continues in lockdown, the conversation around our finances becomes more and more important. And so we've got some pearls of wisdom coming to you guys all the way from the Out of Man, where Chris Staples is going to share a little bit about that. So Chris, take it away. Hi, 412 family. This is Chris here from Living Hope on the Isle of Man. Now, today, consider the ravens. In Luke 12, 24, Jesus said this. He said, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have storehouses, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? And scripture, when it says consider, it means pay attention. Something important is coming up. And I've seen ravens in the harsh highlands of Scotland. And let me tell you, they survive absolutely fine. They're scavengers really, but they have enough food for each day. And this is really a word about sufficiency, the sufficiency of God. God is our El Shaddai. He is the all sufficient one for our daily needs. And that is his promise here. And I think perhaps there's a challenge here to us to say, what are we going to do with our more than sufficiency? Because some of us will have more than our basic daily needs. And once we have paid attention to those and we've returned the tithe to God, what are we going to do with the rest? And that was a challenge Carol and I faced uh, a few years ago. when We felt God speak to us and he challenged us to set a little bit aside each month to bless others and to invest in the things of the kingdom. We call it our charity box. And over the years, sometimes we've had very little in there. Sometimes we've had more and we've been able to bless many people and also see God use giving opportunities. 
And Paul even challenged the church. He said, didn't he? He said, um, set a little bit aside of your weekly income. So when I come, you are not empty handed, but you have something to contribute into the offering. So perhaps in the Ravens, the challenge is not just that we trust God for our sufficiency, but what are we going to do with our more than sufficiency? Amen. Well, bless you guys. And I'll see you very soon. For our next part, we'll have Andrew Selye's apostolic message to the 412 Nation, which is the second last, <laughs> second last part of the series, right? <laughs> 412 Nation. 412 Nation. That That's right. good. I'm loving what you keep coming up with here, guy. I'm loving I'm this. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. It's Andrew Selye's apostolic <laughs> message, guys. Part, part eight. Almost the, oh, you see, you, you also got stuff. Uh, it's the second last one. That's all second that really matters. Awesome. Do you want to give them? Should I give them 30 seconds to get a notebook? I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to grab a coffee, grab a cheese, a slice of cheese or bread. And Make sure you go get a yeah. slice of cheese, guys. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh! Oh yeah, I forgot, guys. 30 seconds timer. Thanks Howie and uh, just again a huge hello to all of you coming. Just great to be enjoying these sessions of Uncorrupted Faith with you and we, can you believe it, are on number eight. And uh, today I'm hoping to look at um, the times of faith. This will be the second last one we're going to do I think. But I want to look at the times of faith with you tonight because I think sometimes we don't realize is that Jesus or God moves differently at different times. I think something I've hoped that you would, all of us would see through this series is that the Lord moves uniquely at unique times. He's a person, he's not a system. And so there's these times in history where the Lord seems to be more active, where there's more miracles and signs and wonders than there are at other times. Now, when you look through the history of the world, right through the history, you'll see God is moving. God is always active. But there's definitely times that God moves more. And I think a failure to realize this has really caused us to struggle to understand that at times we can't make things happen, that the Lord does things more so than he does at other times. And so I want to look at you, look with you together a few portions of scripture, and we're going to explore this together. And hopefully by the end of the session, we're going to see maybe what kind of a time we're in and how we might respond in faith to what the Lord is doing right now. And so let's let's start together. And I'm beginning in the book of John, chapter 2 and verse 4. And just to give you the background to the story, Jesus has not yet performed any miracles. He has just begun his ministry and been baptized in water by John the Baptist, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's gone into the wilderness. And he comes out of the wilderness and he he pulls his disciples with him and he goes to a house uh, where friends of the family are having a wedding as a wedding feast which is a really big deal in uh, Israel in Jerusalem or in Judah and um and so Jesus arrives at this feast and it's obviously huge the community is there and we know the story that right in the middle of the party which would have lasted a few days for a Jewish wedding uh, the wine runs out, which is just hugely embarrassing for the, the folk that are heading up the mother and father of the groom. And it must have been incredibly embarrassing at that point. And there's a bit of a panic. And Jesus' mother, Mary, comes up to him and says to him, kind of like a mom does, you know, Jesus, do something. And in John 2 verse 4, his response for me is fascinating. He says, dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. This is, a, this is an incredible little glimpse into the Lord Jesus keeping in step with the Father, that everything preordained, you know, the Bible says before one day of our lives had come into pass, the Father had preordained good works for us to do. And, and as much as he's done that for us, he also had this to do for Jesus. And, and you've got Jesus saying, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. This is not my time. Why are you involving me in something that my Father hasn't told me to do. Uh, and yet Mary keeps petitioning 
and keeps pushing. And for me, this is an incredible picture of prayer that sometimes I believe we can move the heart of God. We can move the hand of God through prayer. And so she keeps pressing in at the Lord and um, the Lord actually responds. And obviously we, we realize that somehow the father must have shifted things. And now the Lord Jesus gets the okay to do miracles because he only, you know, he said, he only do what I see my heavenly father saying or doing. And so he he gets his water containers and he prays for them. The servants see this and the water turns to wine. And it's been said at that wedding that the, this was by far the best wine that, that people had tasted. And it's this incredible picture of Jesus doing a miracle. But I want to just drill in quickly onto his line, my time has not yet come. Did you and I realize that there's times that God does things, there's times that he's set that he wants to do things, even in the nations, but also in our own lives. Jesus has determined, God has determined that he would do unique things at unique times. And for each of us, we'd have times of where really the Lord's doing accelerated work and times where he will take us into a wilderness period like Jesus, where for a period of time you might not hear the Father or sense the Father being really near us. And so we each will go into these things. But when we bring this concept into this thing of faith, we realize that there'll be times of God doing great things, times of God doing great miracles, and other times that he's not doing as many. And uh, it seems almost as though he's not as active. He's always doing something. And if you will look at that just now, but there's definitely times of accelerated things, God doing greater things. And so in I was just you know thinking about that in my own life. As a younger Christian, I was obviously radically saved out of drugs and out of the occult. And uh, I was really radically set free by just the power of God. Jesus came into me and totally turned my life around. And uh, probably, I think I'd been saved about six months. And the Lord, uh, through a number of prophetic words, people that really know how to hear the Lord, kind of came and shared with me that the Lord was going to give me spiritual eyes that I would see in the realm of the Spirit. Now, um, we don't normally see in the realm of the spirit. Right now we see flesh and blood, uh, but there is a spiritual realm around us that the Bible talks about of angels and demons and principalities and powers. And there's, there's creatures that we cannot see. They're around us. They're very active. The Bible tells us about them, um, but we can't see them normally. But I was told that I would see them for a period of time. And lo and behold, I can't remember when it happened, but suddenly I was able to see in the spirit. And it was a bit like in 2 Kings 6 verse 17, there's a man in the Old Testament called Elisha, who's a prophet. And one morning he, he's woken up and he and his servant are surrounded by this army. And his servant wakes up first, goes out and he's like, we are so dead. This is the enemy's army and they're going to they're gonna kill us. And so he wakes Elisha up uh, Eli and Elisha kind of rises up and, and he's really not perturbed. You know, this army is huge and he realizes they could kill him. Uh, and so he eventually turns to his servant and he prays this prayer. He says, oh, Lord. Please open his eyes so that he may see. And that's in 2 Kings 6, 17. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw that the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So what basically happened was Elisha was able to see in the spiritual realm angels uh, in chariots with horses in war, ready for war, while the servant uh, was not able to see these until he prayed that the servant's eyes would be opened. And I had a, a time in my life for about six months where the Lord opened my eyes to see in the spiritual realm. And it was a wonderful time for me. Uh, I was doing a lot of work with girls coming out of prostitution and out of the occult, out of drugs, uh, dealing with a lot of Satanists and witches and warlocks and um, uh, it was just a, an incredible time of the supernatural in my own walk. Um, I, I would see angels. I would see demons. I was conscious of angels with me all the time. I'd often see them. The Bible speaks about actually that he's given us angels charge over us, that our feet will not strike our stones, and, and that we have a guardian angel. And, and so there was this real sense that as I was living in that time, the supernatural was as real for me as the natural. And I was doing a lot of deliverance. I did a work with the police for a little bit of, uh, for a time, uh, in the, helped just worked a little bit alongside some of the guys in the occult unit. Um, and it was just an incredible time. And then suddenly, just like that, one morning I woke up and was gone. <laughs> and, and I can't tell you why it went. 
but it went. And I've never ever got that sight back. I've never seen in the spirit again. I have, I can tell you, I sense things in the Lord. I know I'd hear his voice. But that specific thing that he did in my life for that time was something that was unique. And, and I learned a lot about faith. I learned a lot about God. I learned a lot about the supernatural. And the Lord has used that time. But that time has come and gone. And so the thing I'm wanting us to see is that there's times in our lives and there's times in the history of the world where the Lord will be doing unique things and other times where he won't be seen to be quite as active or doing something different. And I, and I want to encourage you, you know, you might be in a season or a time now where the Lord might be seeming quite quiet. Or maybe you're in a time where the Lord is just very close. But the promise He gives us is that He will never leave us and never forsake us. And while He leads us by His Spirit into times of quietness and other times of great power and miracles and signs and wonders and, and testimonies of faith, the Lord is always faithful and the Lord is always working. And wherever you find yourself, you can know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is here. He's close to you. He is in your life, whatever you're facing, and he's there to, to help you. And he'll give you what you need when you need it. And so just keep your faith going. Keep walking with him, knowing that even in times of stillness, your faith is being strengthened. And in other times when he's moving in great power, your faith is being strengthened in a different way. It's a different kind of faith. And so I really want us to be encouraged in this. But just to quickly look at these times of quiet times and then these accelerated times of God doing great miracles in nations and in individuals. And I was just thinking about... Um, Israel and Egypt and uh, obviously we've got this bunch of young boys that are brothers and uh, they get led to uh, the nation of Egypt. They, they're they still foreigners, they're traveling around and the 12 young men join and, and become a nation together in Egypt. They go there because of a famine and they end up, their family stays in this nation of Egypt for 430 years. This is just the forming of the Jewish nation or Israel and uh, they, they, kept, they actually end up becoming slaves in Egypt and for 430 years we actually don't know what happened. It's like the Bible is quiet. These were the people of God. These were the children of God. And they were the children of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Um, but they were, you know, we don't know what happened. For 430 years, the Bible just doesn't tell us. We know God was working. But certainly, it seemed almost as though he went quiet for that time. And then suddenly, after 430 years, uh, a young man is born called Moses. And really what's happened is the people have been crying out. The slavery has become so difficult. They've been crying out to God. And God hears them and responds. And a young man called Moses is born. And immediately there's an acceleration of God moving. And, and, and it's not long. And you start to see some of the greatest moves of God in the history of the world. Uh, these plagues that God gives out over the nation of, of Egypt, the, the greatest empire in the world at the time with Pharaoh the king being the most powerful king in the world and these plagues come and they cripple the economy they uh, they, they bring sores and wounds and, and ultimately even the killing of the firstborn this is a time of God actually doing huge things to deliver his people from slavery um, and, and then the deliverance happens and they march out miraculously and it's the time of God has done unbelievable things this new nation fledgling nation comes and as they escape in Egypt, Pharaoh decides to chase them. He wants them back as slaves. And um, they they come to this sea and, and they can't swim it. It's too big. It's huge. They can't swim. They've grown up in the wilderness in the desert. And um, and and the sea parts and a nation of, of hundreds of thousands of people walks through the bottom of the ocean as God holds the, the two parts apart and they walk through. And when they get through and Pharaoh's army tries to follow them, the nation closes and the most powerful army in the world is actually destroyed. It's a time of God doing huge, huge, huge things. And then things quieten down and you, you see God doing things. You see water come from a rock. You see these moments uh, again at the giving of the, the Lord. It's another time as God's doing something big. And normally whenever God brings something new or change, you see an acceleration of God's power. And then once things have settled or that change has been established in his people, it's as though the power of God wanes a little bit and he maybe requires us to have a different kind of faith. 
And so that's very much what happens as they go into the, the wilderness. And then when the Lord is going to take them from the wilderness into the promised land under a new leader, again, you've got this miraculous God doing great things. They come to their first city as they cross into this Canaan, which is now the, the land of Israel. And there is a, a fort that's never been, a city that's never been taken, the city of Jericho. Its walls are so thick. It is impenetrable. It's never fallen. And Israel sees this impenetrable fortress collapse miraculously. They do not have to throw a rock at it. They don't have to throw an arrow, shoot an arrow at it. God causes the walls to miraculously fall down. And this is unprecedented miracles. This is like, oh my goodness. Um, and then once they enter into the promised land, we never see that happen again. It's like the next nation they come to or the next city they come to, the walls don't fall down and they now have to fight their way into the walls. We do see miracles. We do see through that period God doing miraculous things. But it's not quite the same as he did when he first started this journey into Canaan. And this seems to be a pattern right through God's dealing with his people. I remember we're talking patterns and God is a person, not a principle. But these are things that we do notice about how the Lord seems to work Um Likewise, you know, it's interesting, it was 430 years in slavery, and then Moses is raised up. It was, uh, if you go look at the history of Israel right through till, and Judah right through just before Jesus, the last book of the Bible was written in around 400, and th- just around 400, 430 uh, BC, just before Jesus was born, and John the Baptist emerges on the scene. And, um, You've got this silence for 430 years. We don't know what happened. We, we know now historically what happened because it's a bit closer. So we know God moved in that 430 years from Malachi through to Jesus. There was stuff happening. God was moving, but not writing scripture. There's nothing of the big miraculous things that seem to be a part of the nation before that. And then Jesus comes and John the Baptist comes and there is this unprecedented miracles again. After 430 years of of relative silence, you've got this Jesus calming storms, walking on water, feeding 5,000 with a few loaves, miracles, blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, uh, you know, it's just this unprecedented miracles. And then actually towards the end of Jesus' ministry, you actually start to see things dying down as he moves towards his crucifixion. You do see miracles. The night he's crucified, uh, or the night before he's crucified, he heals one of the people that have come to arrest him whose ears been chopped off. He heals his ear. So you're still seeing miracles, but not to the degree that we saw at the peak of his ministry, which is really about halfway through, uh, which is just a fascinating thing, isn't it? This waves of miracles. And then once it's established that he is the Messiah, the miracles seem to start to wane a little bit. Then the birth of the church. Jesus is crucified. Uh, The disciples are waiting in fear and the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost and the church is born. And in this moment, unprecedented miracles again. 3,000 people are saved in one single day. The apostles are suddenly walking around and their shadows are healing people. It's like the city is in revival and even the neighboring areas in revival and it's unprecedented miracles uh, which just seem to be, you know, you just it's just unbelievable the stuff that happens guys are put in prison and angels are releasing them from the jail and they're walking out you know it's just miraculous 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 and then once the church is established you start to see you do see miracles right through the book of acts and right through the the letters but there's definitely a sense that the miracles seem to wane a little bit you know in the at the beginning of the book of acts peter's shadow is healing people as he walks past and people are being raised from the dead it's just unprecedented and then a bit later in Philippians 2 verse 26 and 27, Paul writes and uh, he writes about a friend who is ministering with him and he, he tells us a par- about a paraphrase and he says, for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died. And you go, oh my goodness, you know, beforehand just it's like the miraculous power of God. Everyone's getting healed. But now at this time of their ministry, they're not seeing the same miracles. And this is actually becoming more and more evident as you carry on reading. And in 1 Timothy 5 verse 23, which is also lit, written uh, around a similar time, Timothy's a young man who's moving as an apostle. He's powerfully used to oversee whole regions of the church and ordaining elders. And obviously accustomed to walking with Paul and seeing the miracles that had been really so much a part of their ministry. And Paul writes to him and he says this, stop drinking only water 
and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. And you go, oh my goodness, what's that about? What happened to healing? What happened to you know, laying on hands and, and, and by faith seeing heal, the, the sick healed? Uh, in 2 Timothy 4 verse 20, uh, again, very close to this time, Paul tells us, I left Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. And so you've got this team of guys traveling. It'd be the equivalent of Jonathan and myself and Will Marie or Brad traveling into a nation and one of us becoming so ill that we can't carry on and they have to be left behind. And, and part of you just boggles and you think, well, what happened to laying hands on the sick? What happened to call the elders and you know the prayer of faith will make the person well? And it's just a time where there's less miracles. But it needs to be said, while there were less miracles, there were miracles right the way through the book of Acts, right through to the very end. God is breaking in with the miraculous, but not to the same degree as we see at the beginning of the book of Acts. And so one of the things we'll find, even as we look through history, is you see this. You, you see the world coming to times of really what, what, what we would call depravity or sinfulness, ugliness, where people just seem to be evil on a degree not seen before. And it's invariably when the world is at its darkest that God seems to break in and something new is established and the Lord does something new and there's signs and wonders and miracles and if you go look over church history most of the greatest moves of God were birthed out of times of the worst evil uh, you know the time of the reformation as an example the church is so corrupted it's, it's no longer even represent I mean it's just so corrupted and out of that time the reformation the great awakenings in America I mean, recently in the in the sixties, now recently, which is the time of the sexual revolution, drugs, um, you know, free love, uh, war, the Vietnam War, the Cold War's at its heart. You've got this time of great turmoil in the nations and really evil breaking out in the nations of the world through the sixties. And in the middle of that time, you start to see the, the uh, charismatic renewal emerging, which is a move of God and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And churches are suddenly starting to see the power of the Lord moving like we've not seen in, in centuries before that, as God moves. And what, what we start to see is that when evil, when, when, the, you know, when evil abounds, God raises a standard. And that's exactly what the Bible says, that when the night is at its darkest, God's light seems to start shining the brightest. Uh, and so bringing that to us, you know, we are living again in unprecedented times and evil times. Many of us have been, uh, you know, following Facebook and hearing rumors of, you know, the rise of an antichrist and, uh, you know, this whole thing is going to lead to vaccinations and I don't know what all mocks of the beast. And um, you know, I've been also often recently by by people, are we in the end times? Is it the end? Are we about to see the Antichrist emerging? And I, I, I can't honestly tell you that I know. I can tell you this. I, I can see that what's happening right now is setting the stage for evil, that we are living in times of unprecedented evil. And as the nations start to transform themselves into a new world order and a one world government, uh, and we start to see the nations becoming um, more and more, you know, actually against Christianity, which we already are seeing, these are all signs of the end and certainly we are in an acceleration of these times and, and what I want to say is it's actually not a time to be scared because if you go back through what I've been sharing through the session at times of the worst evil at times of slavery in Egypt at times when a whole nation dies out in the wilderness at times when when the Jesus the Messiah has been crucified then all hope seems to be lost God breaks in and the miraculous breaks in and the power of God breaks in and I honestly believe we are living in un unprecedented times where yes evil is abounding and evil seems to be gaining traction but I honestly believe that we're living in a time when the Lord himself is about to break into time and space and I believe even preceding his return we're going to see a move of the Lord we're going to see revival we're going to see churches planted we're going to see believers scattering but as we scatter like they did in the book of Acts we're going to see churches planted people getting saved and already even through the series we're seeing friends and family that are coming to the Lord because the Lord is actually moving in the middle of what's going on in our world and doing great and incredible things and I really want to encourage us as we watch this I want to encourage you 
We are living in unprecedented times. And it's a time to lift your head because I believe we're going to see miracles and the Lord moving like we've not seen before. It's like the world is hopeless. And that's when the Lord is our hope. When the Lord has lost faith in everything, we have faith in the one who loves us, who loves the world and who wants it to be saved and who's eagerly waiting to break in, to bring his redemption and his healing and his deliverance to the nations of the world that are now dying through COVID and crisis and uh, corruption and poverty and all these different things. It's a time for the Lord to break in. And I'd really love to end the session how I started it. You know, Jesus, the first miracle he did was turning water to wine. And his response when asked to do something was, it's not yet my time. And yet Mary, his mother, kept pursuing him, kept saying, kept pressing him to move. And he did. And we have record of him making the most incredible wine and miraculously moving before, before the plan initially was supposed to work its way out, differently to how it's going to work out. And he responded because Mary prayed. He responded because Mary asked him. And I feel like for us as we watch this, I'd love us to close with asking the Lord. Because as evil is abounding right now and it's going to get worse, the Lord is going to break in to us and through us with signs, wonders and miracles where we will see miraculous things such as we've not seen in our lives. It'll make the charismatic renewal look like it is something weak because of the hand of the Lord. Because the evil we're living in is far greater and the Lord promised Promises when evil abounds, I will raise a standard and a banner of righteousness. And I feel like I just would love in this to close with you and to, 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 to cause you to lift your eyes, to see the imminent move of the Lord. I think we maybe already be tasting a little bit of it and trusting for his hands to do great things. So why don't we just close eyes and bow our heads quickly and um, I just, you know, maybe you're watching this and you don't know the Lord. And if that is you, I want to really encourage you on the screen right now. There is a number that you can phone. Or if you are desperately needing prayer for something, please, there's a number on the screen right now. Please, would you, at the end of this prayer, pick up your phone and phone that number. And we'll have somebody waiting to pray with you or someone to follow you up. And uh, we're trusting that God will be able to meet with you. Uh, and that your life will be changed forever. Or maybe that there'll be breakthrough for you in prayer. But for the rest of us, those that have been listening to this, the Lord moves differently at different times. And so Father, right now as your people, we come before you. And like Mary years ago, she came and she bugged you to do something. Father, there was a crisis and she said, Lord, do something. And you responded, it's not yet time. And we know that you have set aside a time that you will return to. The, you've set aside a time for you to break into time and space. But like Mary, Father, we across the nations watching this want to join our hearts together in prayer, in unity, and say, Jesus, would you please break in? Would you break in with signs and wonders and miracles? Would you break in with the faith we've been looking at through this series, that the gift of faith would start to operate and we would see the sick healed, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. We'd see churches planted. We'd see supernatural financial provision. We'd see the hand of God moving, parting seas and moving mountains because the gracious hand of our God is moving. And so we come before you, Father, in Jesus' name, and we ask together from across the nations, Father, would you move? Would you bring about a move across our churches? From the Isle of Man, through Russia, through the United States, through Australia, through Africa, Father, through India, through all the places you've given us a footprint and even places you want to. Would you raise up a beautiful church for your name, filled with power, filled with signs, wonders and miracles, filled with your presence, Lord God, that the nations could come to the wonder of what it is that you're building and what it is you're doing and that you would establish your glory through the glory of what you're doing in and through your church. Father, we ask that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You've been watching this. Please be encouraged. Just know that the Lord is moving. And if he's quiet in you for a time, he's faithful. And he'll break in at just the right time. In the meantime, it's not a bad thing to ask him, Father, come. I need you in my life. Come and break in and lead me. Let me hear your voice. I'm lacking wisdom. Show me your ways and I'll walk with you, Father, in Jesus' name.
So this is the second last one. Next week will be the last one, our last series on Uncorrupted Faith. It's going to be a very special time. We're going to wrap this whole thing up in a message that I believe the Lord has given me. So watch this space and uh, we'll catch up with you over the next few days and weeks. Bless you guys. Guys, we're, we're almost done with Almost Church this morning. Just two things left. One, we want to share some testimonies uh, of what Jesus has been doing in, in lockdown, in particular in terms of baptisms. Oh. Tell us a bit about your baptism, Bree. So, I got baptized on my first day I came to Josh Jane. So the first day you came to church, first you got day baptized the same day? Exactly. <laughs> and it was super amazing, actually. Like, just the love that people showed. Like, they didn't even know me, but they came to support. After getting baptized, anything changed in your life? Well, yeah. A lot changed in my life, eh? I mean, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. The old ass. God. And then you has come. That is me. And that's me after the old baptism. And this, I just felt a whole sensation of God's love. And you know, for me, your mind really shifts. Like, it really shifts. Eh? You're like, okay, I can't do that anymore. I have to think this way. So, yeah. Well, then, why don't we check out some testimonies of people getting baptized um, and testimonies of God doing other cool stuff in people's lives. Take it away. Hi, I'm Danelle. I started going to Josh Jane at the end of last year with my sister, Gordonay. And I got saved early March with my home group, but because of lockdown and coming home, I couldn't see them again and I couldn't get baptized. But the first night of Passover, I decided to get baptized and then my sister baptized me in our own bathroom. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say that lockdown wasn't going to keep me from getting baptized and it wasn't going to keep me from getting closer to Jesus. And I just want to send that out as a motivation for you guys to just stay strong. Yay! Hello everybody, it's me, Caleb. I'm from Justin David, also a part of Food 12. And today I would like to share my testimony about baptism. On the 8th of April, I got baptized in my bath and my whole community house group was able to watch over Zoom. And being baptized is a big step, is a big step of obedience and following God. If you get baptized, you can know Him as your father and your friend. And even if you give your heart to Jesus, you can also. Duanka, tell us what did you do before the lockdown? I got baptized. And what does a baptism mean to you? It means that I, I gave my, I made a new, new life with Jesus. And my whole life will wash by Him. And now I'm going to go to heaven and I hope I see you all there. Bye. Hi, my name is Gareth. And um, during the course of lockdown, I started studying the Purple Book and spending time with my sister and her husband. We were reading the Bible every evening and discussing it. And last week, uh, last week Wednesday, I heard a testimony of um, Amy baptizing her brother over Zoom. And it gave me the courage to, to um, share that I also wanted to be baptized. And uh, they let everyone know. And um, yeah, I invited some friends, some family tuned in and uh, got baptized on the Sunday in some freezing cold water. And then uh, afterwards, everyone prayed for me, which is a really cool experience. And like I was just having, uh, uh, almost as if I was shivering, even though I was feeling really uh, warm. And just my whole body was uh, shaking a little bit or shivering. It was an uh, incredible experience. Uh, since then, uh, I've been feeling a lot more free and uh, let's say a little bit more open, like the walls around my heart, etc., or maybe come down a little bit and I can share with my family a bit more, etc., which has been great. Guys, that brings us to the end of this week's Almost Church. Remember, if you want to see more, make sure you jump onto 412 Global on Facebook uh, and make sure you like that thing because on a Tuesday evening, there's going to be apostolic input. It'll be one of the last times we're going to be doing a, a Facebook live chat with Andrew and Emma during the Uncorruptible Faith series. So make sure you jump on that if you have any burning questions after this episode. Plus, on a Saturday, you can join us for live worship with sons and daughters in the house. And then on Sunday, we'll be having Almost Church right here 
And yeah, that, that brings, brings us, us to, to the close. Close. Okay. It's so almost like we finish each other's sandwiches. 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 No milk, milk, <laughs> milk, milk. Salah, you've been awesome. Thank um, you. Bluetooth Elbow 5. And what about Bluetooth Hug? Just Bluetooth Hug, dude. Bluetooth Hug. <laughs> uh, guys, hope you have a beautiful Sunday. Awesome. What, are you, what are we going to leave them with, bro? Uh, I can't rap, I can't sing, but Jesus loves you. God loves you. <laughs> and I mean, in Him, you, we all loved. We are more than conquerors. We are, we are His beautiful children and keep doing the hard work. It's not easy, but God is consistent. Yesterday, today, and forever. Preach and it. Yeah, man. It's gonna get tough, but the beautiful thing is we're we're in family, and I'm sure all the families are texted away. And yeah, check it out. We're gonna end off with who we are behind closed doors. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't bad. I mean, I think he's a natural. He's a natural on camera. I mean, for his, for his first time, he did really well. Yeah. Although, this one thing is funny. He actually mentioned to me that a couple of his friends believe that COVID-19 has opened up a portal in the space-time continuum. <laughs> yeah. Natters. I know. Yeah, it's hilarious. Otherwise, things are good? You like her? Yeah, I mean... Dude, for me, it's just... So, this is the great Planet Earth 14692. It's a pleasure to meet you. Doesn't matter what they say, but you gotta you gotta Yeah. We got him. Hey Howard! <laughs> <laughs>